Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this Critical Decision in Emergency Medicine podcast. On this podcast, we'll be discussing the December 2019 issue. With you, Zani Koja. And Wendy Chang. And as I'm sure you know by now, Critical Decisions is made of two lessons. They cover cutting edge material or bread and butter of emergency medicine. And then there's a bunch of other great things. There is the critical procedure, critical image, critical EKG, as well as even the LLSA review, which most of us you know, try to do in December. Which is the perfect month. So for yeah. our first lesson, it's called Visual Aid, Deep Eye Problems. Thank you to Dr. Samantha Sales, Martha Grace Patel, and Narendra Patel for writing this article. All right, so eye complaints. It's not my favorite, but I think this article will help us out a lot, especially the scary stuff involving the iris, the lens, the vitreous chamber, the retina, optic nerve, all that deep eye stuff. So apparently almost half of the ED visits for eye complaints are for things that are emergent, which in all reality, if you think about it, that's like more serious than like chest pains or something like that. Half are emergent. Wow. Okay. So we're going to call ophthalmology for all of them. Yep. That's it. From the door. (laughs) Right. Or we can actually just like talk to the patients first, but you know. That's true. I think history is important because you want to figure out what kind of symptoms they're having, whether it's vision changes, changes in the appearance of their eye, the level of discomfort that they've been having, as well as whether it's been, you know, sudden or gradual and onset, how long it's been going on, any preceding events. How they describe their symptoms are also helpful. If they describe curtain-like obscuring of their vision, that might suggest a process like retinal detachment. What I also found helpful is to ask people always about history of eye surgery, because then when I see irregular pupils, I'm not freaking out thinking it's from their new injury. Very true. So for the exam, I'll tell you what I know. Visual acuity is the vital sign of the eye. So everybody gets a visual acuity. And then you look at their pupils, make sure they're equal, round, and reactive to light. Anything else that we're supposed to do? Yeah, there are a few more things. So while you're trying to figure out if the pupils are reactive to light, you should also check and see if there is an afferent pupillary defect, such as when you shine the light into the eye, both eyes actually remain dilated and are not constricting. That suggests the pathology that's preventing the eye from reaching the central nervous system, such as the optic nerve defect, vitreous hemorrhage, or retinal abnormality. You know, I always thought that afferent pupillary defect was this thing for the boards, but apparently it can be helpful. Got it. Afferent pupillary defect. And then, oh, get a tonometer and measure the pressure of the eye. And then look at their eye and do a slit lump exam and a fluorescein stain. And a fundoscopy. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Visual fields, extraocular movements, fundoscopy. I think we don't do that enough in the ED. When I finished training, I always thought, okay, I'm going to try and look at the eyes of a few patients on every shift. Obviously, it's always too busy to do that. But I think fundoscopy is a skill we can practice more. Especially if their pupils are dilated or if you can dilate their pupils, I'm sure that's going to make life really easy. And so when you do have a patient presenting with symptoms of visual loss, a great way to try and differentiate this is whether or not this is painful vision loss or painless vision loss. And there's a great flow chart in figure one that can help walk through the differential. Things that you can think about are painful loss of vision are things like glaucoma, optic neuritis, end up the mitis. Whereas painless vision loss are things like retinal detachment, central retinal artery or vein occlusion or vitreous hemorrhage. Got it. So I'll tell you my glaucoma story, which was like a horror story from one of my earlier shifts as an attending. I was actually working. I did not have glaucoma. My patient did. So it was middle of the night, single coverage ED. Ambulances were lining down the hallway. It was packed. And this woman comes in sitting on a stretcher, grabbing her head and screaming, give me my Dilaudid. So 
in the midst of everything that was happening, obviously that was triaged to a much lower acuity than everybody else who was there with unstable vital signs and different complaints. And eventually I made my way into her room an hour or two, or I don't know, later. And then it was like the typical story of visual loss, headache, nausea, vomited ones. Her eye was red and her eye looked like glaucoma. It was red. It, her pupil was mid dilated. Her cornea was like cloudy. And then, of course, I grabbed the tonometer and guess what? Her intraocular pressure was elevated. And I was like, oh, if you had started your complaint with, I can't see out of my eye that hurts, this would have been totally different. Yikes. That's so, definitely true. So, how are we supposed to manage angle closure glaucoma? Because, I mean, you know what? We don't see it often and it is an actual true emergency, right? Yeah, definitely. So this is the situation where dilating the pupils will actually worsen the condition. And so your treatment for reversing this angle closure and decreasing intraocular pressure are things like topical and systemic medications, supportive care for pain and vomiting. Uh, and this might be a combination of beta-1 blockers, alpha-2 agonist, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, cholinergic agents, postaglandin analogs. So this is one of the very few times where it's an actual emergency to put eye drops in people. So do it. All right. So let's talk about something else that's scary. Optic neuritis. Because whenever anybody comes in, especially if they're in the correct multiple sclerosis demographic, and they're like, oh, I'm having visual changes. I'm like, no, no, it's scary. I don't know what to do. So what do we do? Who should we worry about optic neuritis in? Uh, right. And so it is definitely a common presentation for MS, as well as I think it can occur often in the course of MS. And these are patients who will have monocular decreased vision, pain with eye movements, an aberrant pupillary defect. And on fendoscopy, you can find optic disc swelling and blurred disc margins. Got it. So MRI, neurology, ophthalmology, everyone comes down for that. <laughs> yes. All right. What do we want to talk about? So also another cause of painful vision loss is endophthalmitis. That sounds easy. It's an infection of the eye. So there's going to be pus coming out of your eye after trauma or surgery. Pretty much. But I think that a lot of times the presentation is not as dramatic because these people can actually be afebrile and quite well appearing. They don't have a systemic infection. And, but their symptoms of decreasing vision, floaters, eye pain. You can also find a hypopion or silent flare on slit lamp. Also another emergency because people can lose their vision. Got it. And they just need antibiotics in their eye, not like IV antibiotics, right? Usually, yeah. All right. So how about painless causes of vision loss? You mentioned a few. So which one do you want to talk about first? Well, we can talk about central retinal artery occlusion because it is a stroke, essentially. Oh, my um, gosh, Wendy. You just find it. It's, it's unbelievable. You just find it everywhere. <laughs> yes, exactly. These are patients that present, as we mentioned, with painless loss of vision. It can be of the whole visual field or a part of a visual field if it's just a branch off of the central retinal artery. And they can be preceded by a TIA of this symptom or amaurosis fugats. The findings you're looking for are pale ischemic discs, retinal edema. Maybe you'll see a cherry red fovea boxcar appearance of the arteries and veins. Uh, but definitely, again, as we're going through all these ophthalmologic emergencies, you want to get this uh, treated within 90 minutes before uh, the patient would have permanent vision loss. All right. Well, how are you supposed to fix this? Because this sounds really scary. It does. And it's the one condition where you actually want to put pressure on the eye. Oh. You're going to massage the eye for 10 seconds, then release it for five. This way, hopefully you can dislodge the embolus. And you can also promote vasodilation by letting the patient breathe into a bag or carbon dioxide mixed with oxygen to increase their CO2 level. 
and then you're going to give medications to decrease the intraocular pressure. When you call an ophthalmologist, they might actually do ocular paracentesis. Oh, huh. the article doesn't really talk about it, but hyperbaric oxygen should definitely be considered within 24 hours if you have that facility available to you, because that might make a difference between someone being blind and not. So, yeah. What else are we going to talk about? So it's corollary central retinal vein occlusion is common in elderly people with vascular comorbidities. It's not as emergent, of course, as an arterial occlusion, but these can also lead to worsening symptoms and loss of vision. All right. So CROW, which is artery occlusion, venous occlusion, now retinal detachment. I know with retinal detachment, people come in complaining of floaters and flashing lights. What else should we think of? So the floaters may actually not be very impressive because they can actually get better with time. So there's a great image in the article that shows a fundoscopy of retinal detachment. And it can show that the retinal break can actually be obscured by vitreous hemorrhage. So they're often associated. All right. So let's just talk about vitreous hemorrhage by itself then. So we often think about this in diabetics, people who've had ocular trauma, or people who've had PVD, not to be confused with peripheral vascular disease, but actually posterior vitreous detachment. And this is basically where the blood vessels rupture, or there's a disease structure. Patients can prevent with blurry vision, sudden painless vision loss, and they can also complain of a red hue to their vision, have similar symptoms like floaters, shadows, cobwebs. They tend to be worse in the morning because if you think about it, they're laying down and they might obscure their vision that way. So how do you fix that? So do you have to like call ophthalmology to come down and see them immediately? Not necessarily. The main things you want to do once you've diagnosed this is tell them to avoid strenuous activity, sleep with their head up so that the blood can kind of layer on the bottom and not obscure their vision. But follow up with ophthalmology is important because then they'll treat this more definitively. Got it. And it's like the urgent see ophthalmology in the morning kind of thing, not yeah. in six months. Exactly. Got it. How about uveitis? Well, so uveitis or iritis, if you're dealing with the anterior chamber, causes painful or painless symptoms because it really depends on the degree of inflammation. So patients often present with redness and photophobia. They're going to have a constricted pupil. And you have to think about what this could be related to, because you can find this in patients who have HIV, syphilis, autoimmune diseases. You also find the classic cell and flare on the slit lamp exam. All right. So what is the role of ultrasound in taking care of people with eye complaints? Well, the eye is perfect for ultrasound evaluation since it's very superficial and it's liquid filled. And so you can do this with the patient supine or partially upright. And you're going to scan in both planes, avoid putting pressure on the eye itself. And it's really helpful when you're looking for retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, or even optic nerve swelling. Got it. So this is a great article. It does summarize a lot of deep eye complaints, as you had said, that we are not necessarily as comfortable looking at. And my biggest take-home points are if somebody has subjective or objective decreased monocular vision, a visual field loss then we have to do a thorough exam and we should have them urgently evaluated by an ophthalmologist. Urgently means within the next 24 hours. Now, obviously, if on our examination we find things like CROW, retinal artery occlusion, or retinal detachment, or obviously acute closure glaucoma or endophthalmitis, those are people that need to be treated quickly, like very quickly, within the next couple of hours by an ophthalmologist and or other services, so like neurology for Crow and so on, in order for them to have the best outcome for their vision. And my other take home point is, do afferent pupillary defects? Well, don't do a defect, look for the defect. Do the exam looking for the defect. (laughs) That's great. So moving on to our next part of the issue, which is the critical EKG. And this EKG actually continues our theme of things that hide ischemia, because we've been talking about heart blocks and left bone branch blocks over the past couple of issues. For this one, we're talking about LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy, 
with repolarization abnormality or strain pattern. So as a reminder, LVH can be a pretty large S in V1, so it's larger than 35 millimeters, plus a large R in V6, so also larger than 35 millimeter. And with that, you may have that strain pattern, which is asymmetric T-wave inversions in 1, AVL, V4 to V6, maybe also in lead 2, and maybe you would have some ST depression in these leads, which just sounds pretty much like ischemia. Now, if a person has LVH and they have it exactly this way, so they are asymmetric, they're in these exact leads, you're fine. But if they're in other leads or these T waves are symmetric, then you should definitely think of ischemia because LVH can be called ischemia and ischemia can get called LVH and that's badness on both ends. But if you do have an ODKG, that can help you figure this out. That is a fantastic tip. So for our critical cases in orthopedics and trauma this month, it is a case of severe polytrauma following an MVC where this young man sustained severe injuries to both legs and ended up having increased uh, compartment pressures requiring bilateral leg fasciotomies. It's a great reminder that there are four compartments in the lower leg, the anterior, lateral, superficial, and deep posterior. And this is illustrated in one of the figures, as well as how and where to do your long incisions for your fasciotomies. Definitely a great reminder of a procedure that we don't do often, but if we need to do it, we need to do it right and quickly. So definitely take a look. For our LLSA review this month, it's on TIA. Oh this, my um, gosh, Wendy. This is, no, you know what? You don't get to enjoy the fact that it's an LSA review, which is your favorite part of the whole publication. And yes. you get to talk about TIAs. You are too happy yes. right now. <laughs> it's December. It's like an early Christmas present to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, here you go. Happy holidays. Enjoy your gift. <laughs> So this is on the ASAP 2016 clinical policy on how to evaluate and manage uh, patients with TIAs. It's a good reminder that a lot of what we do in the ED with a patient with TIA is really trying to risk stratify the patient and figure out who is at highest risk for having a recurrent stroke. And so while the ABCD2 score is the most widely used, it really doesn't appear to be reliable in predicting the patient's risk at least in the ED setting. In terms of imaging, CTs are obviously not as sensitive as MRIs to help figure out if the patient has findings of maybe clinically silent strokes. As part of the evaluation, you do also want to do imaging of the intracranial and cervical vessels because if a patient has a stenosis greater than 50%, they are at higher risk of a, a stroke. And a lot of this will also depend on your resources, because if you have an observation protocol or unit, you can certainly use this for patients who are low risk and get the imaging echo and neurology consult done there. But for high risk patients, and these are patients with AFib, valvular disease, abnormal imaging, or known keratostenosis, they should be admitted to really be optimally managed. Well, that's a fantastic review for a topic that is definitely a scary one and one that's fraught with lots of misses and mismanagements. So for our second article, Just Breathe, Rapid Sequence Intubation, thank you to the authors Josh McLean, Ben Lawner, and Ken Butler. And with us is actually Ben Lawner himself on the podcast. Welcome, Ben. Glad to be here. Thanks. Sorry I couldn't accompany Doctors Butler and McLean. I'll try to make up in terms of personality and ranting. <laughs> but welcome, Don. Thank you. We're excited to have you. And the topic obviously is of interest to all of us in emergency medicine since RSI is such an essential skill. And adverse events actually double if we fail our first attempt. So there's a bunch of things that we should do to make this go better. What are they? So you are absolutely correct. RSI is not only a necessary, but also a universal skill. And as such, when I think people decide to employ it, there are a couple of things that can help. And a couple of things, just to name a few, and there are indeed more than a few, positioning, pretreatment, you have to think of your induction agents and so forth. And then I think the most important part of RSI is that small sort of collection of techniques that help us to maximize the glottic exposure. Well, that sounds like an awesome list. Let's start with the first one, which is positioning the patient. 
What are your recommendations about that? You know, Dr. Koja, these are not my recommendations. This is the evidence-based practice <laughs> of positioning. <laughs> you know, I should say, um, so this is something I hold dearly because, you know, in terms of paramedic heritage, we're so used to, you know, a, a common adage is, oh, it's patients are poorly positioned. You know, they, they tend to present in very unusual situations so we can intubate in any position. But the fact is, is that positioning has to be a very highly conserved sort of technique. So you always want the external auditory meatus is basically at the level of the sternal notch. And that even applies when you're worried about the cervical spine. The reason why that is, is because it helps draw your eyes to the glottic opening. So even if the patient is in a difficult position, the first pass success is definitely correlated with how you position your patient. So here's sternal notch. There's some articles that suggest you should perhaps maybe elevate the head of the bed a little bit that will help prevent some unnecessary or rapid desaturation. It may also help with the glottic opening as well. And there's a pretty cool image actually in the article about how to ramp up the obese patient and align their ear to the sternal notch. Did you draw that, Ben? Oh, I wish I could, but it would probably be a, a less appropriate doodle, not suitable for inclusion, but I did not. <laughs> um, I think the irritable sternal notch thing is very interesting as well. A lot of uh, clinicians will suggest that obesity is like an independent predictor of a difficult airway, but actually it's because sometimes we have trouble aligning that ear to the sternal notch. So when we're mindful of positioning, sometimes it can take some of the difficulties of the, oh, the quote-unquote obese airway and uh, make it a little bit easier for you. So that is a kind of a universal guide for positioning. So what about the next step, oxygenation? Any tips for that? Yeah, I think as emergency clinicians... Those of us engaged in emergency airway management, I think we talk about two things. One is pre-oxygenation, the other is apneic oxygenation. So the first has to do with nitrogen washout. So that's basically a non-rebreather face mask turned to a high flow, and that will facilitate washout and um, hopefully get as close to 100% as possible. Then there's also apneic oxygenation where uh, we're turning the flow rate all the way up on a flow meter, for example, on a nasal cannula and you're putting the nasal cannula at least 15 liters a minute, and that actually will help maintain the oxygen saturation during the time that paralytics uh, take effect. So essentially two strategies for kind of pre-oxygenation, and they both kind of encompass those things. What about the use of a bag valve mask? You know, this is something that changes, and I'd love to hear, I think this is not without controversy. So I, I remember the great Amal Matu uh, a while ago, he said, you know, the perfect RSI is one time without ventilation. We used to always just we used to try to avoid insufflation with a bag valve mask. There was a recent trial called the PREVENT trial that talked about if you're using very low tidal volume ventilation and you have a very good seal, you can actually ventilate, especially if your patient is at risk for desaturation. So patients that physiologically challenge, so the shocked patient, uh, the patient that is extremely hypoperfused, you may actually have to ventilate these patients. So I would say if your pre-oxygenation is not working and you can't get up to 100%, that's where you can consider very controlled, low-volume ventilation. Or other patients at risk for desaturation, it's okay to give a breath just to make sure that the chest rises, and that can prevent that desaturation. Ideally, in the perfect world, you know, pure RSI, as we mentioned at the beginning of this comment, involves no positive pressure. But it turns out that it may not be a bad thing. It may actually help avoid complications. So judicious use of positive pressure ventilation when indicated. Got it. And then this thing that people do, which is that they hover the bag valve mask over people's faces. How do you feel about that? Hovering's great, I guess, if you want to diffuse oxygen throughout the room, perhaps. <laughs> um, but I think it's important, especially if you're using a bag valve mask, you've got to have a good seal. And there's lots of tips and tricks on the uh, interwebs about how to do that. But make sure you have a good contact with the patient. And it also would, would ensure, especially now that you have a PEEP valve because sometimes it can be very difficult to generate uh, the pressure sufficient to give that breath. So a lot of other interesting research coming down the line about flow governed bag valve masks, for example, to ensure that you can only give a specific volume. But I think in general, we've done a much better job of positive pressure ventilations now. We use lower volumes and just enough to get that chest to rise. But hovering, unfortunately, will probably not get the air where it needs to go. Got it. So no hovering. Try not to, unless you're very light on your feet. <laughs> the diffuser technique we can think about for the hovering that's kind of funny well how about using a non-rebreather a non-rebreather is certainly a great technique for the spontaneously breathing patient you have to make sure that the flow is up as high as possible and, and like with a bag valve mask you want to have a good seal got it so all of these things that you're talking about pre-oxygenating patients 
how long are we supposed to pre-oxygenate them for? It's a good question. I think the literature would probably suggest anywhere between three to five minutes. Got it. You know, especially, I think there's a lot of discussion sometimes now, especially with the mantra. We know, so RSI is a great tool. We talked about it being a universal tool. It may not be the best option for everyone, and sometimes it requires a little bit of modification, especially if your patient is physiologically challenged. So sometimes it has to be shorter or longer, depending upon the patient's reserve. But the bottom line is you want the patients as close to 100% as possible before you intubate. That's number one. And then for number two, some patients are at very high risk of decompensation, so you may have to shorten your time for the pre oxygenation window, but usually about three to five minutes. Got it. So do we pre-treat patients before we intubate them? I think uh, the year 2000 just called and wants their podcast back. <laughs> so, wow. You know, this is a, that's a good one. But, you know, for pre-treatment, and I, as again, back in paramedic heritage, I feel like it's a great way to look at some of these myths. So I used to learn things like lean, lidocaine, you know, and then you had atropine and naloxone and opiates, or uh, there were all these different mnemonics about pre-treatment. Uh, the bottom line with pre-treatment is that it doesn't have any roots in evidence-based medicine. In some studies, uh, which, are, which are admittedly small, the use of lidocaine can actually increase complications. So your best pretreatment is essentially the only treatment. In other words, if you choose to deploy RSI and somebody is a candidate for rapid sequence induction or intubation, that is essentially a sedative and a paralytic. So unless you're talking about, let's say, a neonate, and there may be some indication if you talk to your pediatric intensive care colleagues that maybe it's increased vagal tone, maybe they respond to atropine, but in general, there's really no utility for pretreatment, especially not lidocaine. And I know that topic is very near and dear to Dr. Wendy's heart as well, uh, <laughs> being her uh, having her niche in neurocritical care, but yeah, no evidence for the use of lidocaine. So what are we supposed to do for people who may have an increased ICP? That is an excellent question. I think first you have to choose the you have to choose your intubation technique wisely. Make sure you have your your most well trained intubator there. The other thing is you have to avoid two things. So at all costs, which is hypotension and hypoxia. So if we're really talking about pretreatment, we have to pay attention to those metrics. And that goes back to what you mentioned earlier, where these patients may need positive pressure ventilation. There's a great trial that just came out called the EPIC-TBI trial, and it included a lot of patients that were, uh, with severe brain injury in the field. And the, the risk ratio for mortality uh, nearly doubled when you had even one episode. So we see this kind of mantra, this cautionary tale repeated in a lot of the airway literature. So I would say avoid those two things, and then you may want to use an agent that actually increases brain perfusion, which is where ketamine may also have some utility. Because of all the drugs, there's really no such thing as hemodynamic neutrality. So you want to use a drug that probably maintains your CPP and maintains your MAP. And, and likely in a patient that is critically ill, ketamine may be a good choice. So ketamine is the perfect induction agent for everybody? Of course. So that's a great question. I love ketamine. I actually have it with my food. I put it in my drinks as well. I think it's like <laughs> You know, we do love our ketamine. We do love our ketamine. I think there, there are a couple of studies that talked about our patients that had uh, severe septic shock in whom their catecholamines were depleted. There was sort of this paradoxical hypotension scene in that particular group. So like with anything else, RSI is about guidelines and standards of practice. And I think we modify them with everything that we learn. So ketamine, I think, is a pretty good drug, but it, it's not without side effects. So in the patients with the catecholamines that are depleted, you have to worry about. But all in all, I, of all the induction agents, it has a pretty decent safety profile. So who's your second favorite induction agent? Oh, my. Second favorite. I would have to say, I hope I'm hedging nicely, maybe Atomidate. I think Atomidate is adjustable. So it is a drug that has a fairly long track record of use. You can actually give it half dose if you're worried about hypotension or repeat the dose. But in terms of drugs with a favorable hemodynamic profile, I think Atomidate works well. And I know you didn't ask about my third favorite, but there are some... some but you'll share it anyway. You, oh, you got me, Dr. <laughs> yes, but maybe high, higher doses of fentanyl. It all depends, right? It's on the clinical situation. For example, I don't know how um, uh, you'd feel about high dose midazolam for status, for example. That may be a very good drug. Or propofol. So I think that was a first, second, third, and fourth, but that was just for you. Thank you. <laughs> I was keeping the rants and the preferences to a five out of 10. <laughs> so what is the perfect paralytic then? Oh, that's a, such a leading question. So to, to avoid all the haters out there, um, there is no perfect paralytic agent. 
the perfect one is one that you could immediately suck back out of the IV, right, if things don't go well. What I would say is I prefer rocuronium simply because if you look at a drug with a worsened side effects profile, succinylcholine, uh, you worry about certainly the hyperkalemia. Um, it also has some adverse neurologic effects for patients with underlying myelopathies. The other thing with succinylcholine is it's pretty hard to redose. So if there's a problem with the attempt, I really would not prefer my patients wake up or move during a failed intubation attempt. So uh, personally, I prefer ROC. The only other thing I would add is if you look at a lot of the systematic reviews, ROC sometimes doesn't perform as well in terms of time to paralysis. But I think that's partially because people aren't giving it at a good physiologic dose, which is at least about 1 to 1.2 mg per kilogram. So the short answer is rock your own, but uh, much respect to all those. You sucks. It's got a good track record as well. It just has uh, quite a few side effects. Okay. All right. You have one opinion on that one. So what about the verdict on cricoid pressure? Oh, that's easy. Just don't do it. I, I mean, so cricoid was initially conceptualized in the 1960s with Dr. Selleck when we really didn't have good techniques to expose the glottis, which is another topic that we can perhaps cover in the article. But cricoid pressure um, has not really been shown to increase the laryngeal view. And I think with what we talked about before, I mean, the low tidal volume ventilation, getting a good seal, we're not really over distending and overzealously overventilating our patients. So I think in most situations, cricoid thyroid uh, pressure uh, doesn't really have a an important sort of imperative role in emergency airway management. You're not going to increase your view and you're not going to increase the incidence of insufflation or regurgitation. All right. So if we can't use cricoid pressure to maximize our view, what are we supposed to do? So uh, you are looking down that glottic opening and we're getting right there. Now, I've always said, especially to our interns and our paramedics and actually intubators with varying degrees of expertise, it's ideal to see the cords, but you don't need to see them. The most important thing to do is see the glottic opening. So that starts with the progressive epiglottoscopy, moving the tongue all the way to the left. And when you see the epiglottis, you're not done. So seeing the epiglottis is great because you know you're in the right area, but there are three things that you can do to maximize your glottic view. Number one is external laryngeal manipulation. Take your right hand that is not doing anything. It's sitting there waiting for a tube. Put it over the thyroid or the laryngeal cartilage and move it. Number two is you've got to engage the vollecula. So you've got to push forward, and my anatomy professor would be very happy. You push forward to engage that hyoepiglottic ligament to indirectly lift up that epiglottis, especially if you're using the Macintosh blade. And number three is simply a head elevated laryngoscopic position where, especially if you're not worried about spinal precautions, you can elevate or your assistant can elevate the patient's head, thereby making the angle, your visual angle towards the glottis a little bit less hyperacute. So those are three strategies. There are others, but those are things when you're looking right at that glottic opening, you want to turn it to a grade, you know, from a grade three to a grade one, uh, a couple of things you can do to maximize your chances of getting it through the, the, the cords. And just to be clear, when you're saying external laryngeal manipulation, you basically mean that the intubator puts their hand and then they guide the assistant's hand to where they want it to be. It's not like the cricoid pressure was just random pressure on the cricoid, right? That is absolutely well said. And, and there are a lot of ways to do it. Some people say backward, upward, and rightward. But Levitan, of course, uh, much credit goes to him. It's essentially movement of the laryngeal cartilage to the right, to the left, or backward, wherever you can see it. And then you basically tell your assistant, if you're lucky enough to have one of those, to basically put their hand over yours. So it's essentially manipulation to achieve the best glottic view as opposed to just downward pressure on a cricoid membrane. Okay. So how do you want to angle your stylet? So I think a lot of times straight to cuff. So it, it comes out of the package a lot of times, either prepackaged or in this nice crescent shape. And sometimes that does not get the distal tip of the tube out of your view. So essentially straight needs to be very straight until it reaches that distal cuff. And that's about a 25 to 30 degree bend. Now I know it's really hard because we don't, obviously we're not going to have protractors out to measure that angle, but you want to make it not so acute so that you don't impede the advancement of the endotracheal tube. I mean, I thought we we're supposed to have a protractor as well as a caliper with us on our ships. I well, do. I know we all have calipers being training with Dr. Matu. I, I left my protractors at home or <laughs> next time. It's I'll put the measure bowler's angle and those things. 
Oh, you're absolutely right. I knew there was something I forgot in the Earth Bowler's angle. That's right. <laughs> Board of you heard it here first. Board of you and RSI. <laughs> well said. Well, when we're done shopping for our next shift, apparently at a stationery store. <laughs> I'm sure there's an well, app for this anyway. I'm sure there is. <laughs> what would you do? What if you can see everything that you need to see and you still can't pass the tube? So if you can see everything, you can try to rotate the bevel a little bit more posteriorly. That may help facilitate passage. Sometimes if you have the views, sometimes actually just using the water-based lubrication of a tube may help as well. The other thing is sometimes there's subtracheal or subglottic stenosis, and that may require you need a smaller tube. It's important to remember with intubation, it is not about force. It is never about force. So if you're trying to jam it through the cord, something is going wrong. You need to either readjust your technique or rotate the bevel, lubricate the tube, or try a size smaller. I mean, I, these aren't really big intubation arms, as you can clearly see. So if I can do it, I think anybody can do it. <laughs> awesome. Those are a lot of great tips and tricks. Anything else for our listeners? So I think intubation, as we've mentioned, is all about preparation. So RSI, ironically, should be rapid when you're giving the drugs, but it is anything but rapid in its execution, which is why it may not be for everybody. It's for the majority of the encounters that you have. So in terms of tips and tricks, I would mention checklists, and I would verbalize the plan so everybody in the room knows. If you have a bad intubation, they know when to deploy your scalpel for your correct retardotomies. And the other thing is practice. You, you've just got to keep practicing because there's initial curve in terms of learning, and there's also skills maintenance. I think that's all the intubation secrets there are. Perfect. Well, I learned a lot in terms of reviewing how to perfect our intubation skills. I agree that preparation is key, especially positioning and optimizing your pre-oxygenation and after oxygenation. Figuring out how your equipment works is important, including your bag bell mask. We don't have a verdict on, of course, the perfect induction agent or potentially even a paralytic. Uh, it really depends on your patient. But be prepared to intubate, especially if you've gone down the path of RSI with paralysis. Don't forget to check out in this article uh, the figure on the difficult airway algorithm, because it's important to always think about when you might need to call for help. Uh, it's always uh, better to have more hands on deck than that. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for being with us on the podcast. We have personally enjoyed it a lot. Wendy, sorry, I'm speaking for you. <laughs> <laughs> but as always, I've also learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Look forward to talking to you guys again. Thanks. So for our critical procedure this month, it's something that follows along with the whole RSI topic, which is the concept of endoscopic intubation, which is basically intubating using a fiber optic scope. And the number one reason for failure of that is lack of familiarity with the equipment that you have in your shop. So definitely take a look practice using it, look at the buttons, look at what they are, and simulation is obviously a great tool for something like that. There's a bunch of logistics that you need to try to figure out. Like, do you have to load the ET tube on the scope first? Is it disposable so you can actually just cut it when you load it later? What size actually fits on your scope? Because you probably need a tube that's around a millimeter larger than the scope itself. And how to maneuver it. So basically how to play the video game of, can I see through my scope? So yeah, play video games and, you know. Right. Uh, so some people attach oxygen to the suction port and while it may help you prevent lens fogging, it can actually lead to stomach insufflation. So that's a pretty bad idea. Definitely. And remember that gravity is your friend. Not when people fall, but, but in this particular situation, gravity is your friend. So patients have to be upright or semi-upright if you have an assistant that can help to make sure that your patient's positioned well, if they're not awake and they're laying flat, so let's say this is not your you know, primary way of intubating the person who's awake or sedated, then your assistant can help you open the mouth to be able to kind of maneuver your scope around. And definitely remember, which is beyond the scope of this discussion, that in order for this to succeed, other than being familiar with your equipment, you need to prep the patient. So lidocaine to numb them up, they need to have a sedative or anxiolytic on board because, you know, if they're not cooperating with you and they're not comfortable, this is not going to work. 
I agree. I think positioning is also very important, just like when we were talking about RSI and intubation, at least with the times that I've tried to do this, just using the little mouth guard bite block that comes with, at least oftentimes bronchoscopes are, is not sufficient because the tongue is still in the way. So having your assistant, you know, open the mouth or do use a tongue depressor or something will be super helpful. And if the tube gets stuck while you're trying to advance it, you can try rotating it 90 degrees. So definitely a great reminder of something that we don't do often. And there's a bunch of great videos online to kind of remind you of the technique when you're practicing in your own shop. So for our critical image this month, it's a very interesting case of a patient with head trauma who presents with headache and vomiting, but is neurologically intact on his exam. And it's actually a case of a patient with a vertex epidural hematoma, which can actually be missed on a routine head CT since the skull and the adjacent blood has similar densities and it can actually be kind of a blind spot. Remember that these patients can actually have a worse outcome, although all epidurals certainly can have bad outcomes, but at least compared to patients with a temporal epidural, since this bleeding can be actually from the superior sagittal sinus and can impair venous outflow and increase ICP in that way. It's a great reminder that I always uh, re-window my CTs when I'm looking for epidurals and subdurals because both can be missed. Really cool images and definitely great tips for when you're looking at your own images, which you should do all the time. Exactly. So for our drug box this month, it's another drug that is new and I don't know how to pronounce it. I think it is lasmeditin, but I don't know. Tell Wendy. Me what you think. It is a new drug, so we can make up whatever I, we want. Oh, uh, yeah, great. So I, I'm going to call it lasmeditin. I don't know. Got it. Really lasmeditin it is. <laughs> but it is a new class of drugs to treat migraines, and specifically, it is designed for patients who may not be good candidates for tryptans because it doesn't have the cardiovascular risks. Unclear how we would utilize this in the ED but it is a medication that can cause sedation, dizziness, and that's dose dependent. And I'd like to take a moment and point out how you just got to talk about a whole bunch of neuro stuff. You talked about TIAs, you talked about epidural hematomas, and of course your drug box was a migraine headache yeah. drug. But you know what? I see what you've done and I will take the best thing in this article. Our tox box this month is caffeine toxicity. Ta, ta, ta. There's no such thing as caffeine toxicity. No, as so evidenced I, by the both of us with how much caffeine <laughs> we ingest. There's caffeine deprivation. Yeah. So we, just, we, we skate by just under the toxic level. So we function, <laughs> but don't need these treatments. So interestingly, the reason people are now overdosing on caffeine other than on purpose, which is bizarre, is that it's present in powders and tablets and things like that that people use for energy. And that's how people get caffeine toxic outside of just, you know, drinking amazing coffee. And it is lethal. So caffeine can be lethal if you ingest more than 100 milligrams per kilo, which if you think about it, your average drink has 100 milligrams in it. So if you have as many drinks as you have kilos in your body, then that is your toxic level. Unless you're a child, because with children, their toxic level is 35 milligrams per kilo, which is a lot easier to get to. So of course, I won't talk about toxicity, but I will talk about coffee. So the peak effect of coffee is less than two hours and the half-life is four to five hours. So if somebody overdoses on their caffeine, that's pretty much how long you need to watch them to make sure they're fine. Now, if someone truly has overdosed on caffeine, then they can have hyperglycemia, acidosis, hypokalemia, tachydysrhythmias, and seizures. And you would treat that the way you would treat everything else, which is like esmolol for your tachydysrhythmias. And if you have a refractory dysrhythmia or refractory seizure, then you can actually dialyze caffeine out, which actually makes me think, like, if you're a dialysis patient, should you, like, not have your cup of coffee before dialysis or if you have your cup of coffee before dialysis it doesn't count and then you have another cup of coffee after dialysis that should be our new study one day that's yes. it how because a lot of times our patients also feel you know very fatigued after dialysis so maybe it's just caffeine 
this sounds fantastic. You know what? This is it. Done. After this episode, you and I are going to sit down and write down what we're doing for our new study. And our dear listeners, if any of you is interested in caffeine withdrawal status post dialysis study, then just contact us on Twitter. Or for that matter, contact us for anything that you want to talk about regarding critical decisions or any of the topics that we talked about. We would love to hear from you. My Twitter handle is at Danya Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. And this is our last podcast of this year. So happy new year. And we will talk to you guys next year. In 2020. Bye.